Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Connected by Glass program. My name is Katherine Aguilar. I'm a science educator here at the Corning Museum of Glass, and I will be the host for today's event. Today, we'll be talking about everyone's favorite dishware, Corel, which celebrated its 50th birthday last year in 2020. To mark this milestone, we at the Corning Museum of Glass opened an exhibition called Dish It, Corel at 50, which is on view in the museum's Innovation Focus Gallery. This exhibition explores the distinctive science, manufacturing, and design that have made Corel so popular the world over. If you haven't had a chance to see Dish It yet, I encourage you to visit the Corning Museum of Glass soon to enjoy Dish It, Corel at 50, and the other wonderful exhibitions that have opened this summer. Next slide, please. Today, I am joined by three talented speakers. First up is Colleen McFarland Rademacher. Colleen is the Manager of Archives and Special Collections in the Rekav Research Library here at the Corning Museum of Glass. Colleen will be sharing a brief history of Corel, and toward the end of the program, she'll share some treasure, treasures that she found in the Corel archive. We also have David Earle joining us. David is the Vice President of Glass Engineering and Technology at Instant Brands, which is the parent company that now owns Corel. He'll be sharing a little bit about the technology that sets Corel apart from other glass tableware. And finally, we will hear from Rosemary Mingle, Senior Designer at Instant Brands. She'll tell us about what goes into creating decorative patterns for Corel and share some exciting new designs. I can't wait. So let's get to it. First up is Colleen McFarlane Rademacher. Since 2017, Colleen has served as the Manager of Archives and Special Collections at the Raycal Research Library. She has 18 years of experience in academic, religious, and museum archives, and she has published in several journals, including Archival Issues, Archival Outlook, Catholic Library Journal, and the Wisconsin Magazine of History. She holds a BA in German and History from the College of Worcester, an MA in History from Cornell University, and an MLIS from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. She is the proud owner of a set of Corel dishes in the frost pattern. Take it away, Colleen. Thank you, Catherine. I'm so delighted to be here and I love my Corel dishes. Um, but I want to start our time together today by providing some context for the Corel brand and its products. As many people are aware, Corel was developed by Corning Incorporated, which produced some of the most beloved kitchenware of the 20th century. But it's less well known that Corel had a very different origin story than Pyrex or Corningware. While Pyrex and Corningware might best be characterized as happy accidents that followed discoveries made by Corning's research scientists, Corel was a deliberate innovation intended to improve household dishware and the sales performance of Corning housewares products. Can you uh, show my first slide, please? Great. Okay, so we're going to start with Pyrex. How can we not start with Pyrex? Pyrex is, is Corning's famous line of glass bakingware, and it was first introduced to the market in 1915. Now, Corning, the company, had not set out to develop a great baking dish. Rather, Corning scientists had developed a low expansion glass resistant to breakage that they branded as Nonex in 1908, and they used to improve the performance of railroad lanterns. Bessie Littleton, the wife of Corning scientist Jesse Littleton, was the first to try baking in Nonex. Her husband brought home two modified battery jars for her to make cakes in, and the rest is history. A lead-free recipe for Nonex was developed, Pyrex baking dishes were born, and a robust advertising campaign promoted them to American homemakers. Pyrex was a tremendous commercial success for the company, and the brand has enjoyed popularity with customers worldwide for over a century. Next slide. 
So similarly, corningware was not a deliberate innovation. Uh, glass ceramics is the, the material that corningware is made out of, and it was discovered in 1952 by Don Stuckey, also a research scientist at Corning, who had a really interesting laboratory mishap. A furnace containing a glass plate overheated, and Stuckey was surprised to find that the plate had not melted. Furthermore, when he took the plate out, he accidentally dropped it on the floor, and the glass plate should have broken, of course, but didn't. Um, and so this new material was studied, refined, and then branded as pyroceram, and it turned out to be extremely useful in cookware for the stovetop, and it could withstand direct transfer from the freezer to the oven. Another Corning powerhouse product for the kitchen came to life and met the demands of a contemporary kitchen. And again, a strong print advertising campaign made sure that word got out. Next slide. Uh, Corel, however, was not a happy accident. It required an intentional and concerted effort to make the lightweight break resistant dishes. And we might think of the Centura Ware brand and its products as a bridge between Corningware and Corel. Centura Ware was introduced in 1961 and was expected to be the next of Corning's happy accidents. It was made from a laminate of pyrosalam and glass, and Corning Incorporated had developed this product and branded it as Chemcore and thought, well, why not make dishes out of it? Uh, but unfortunately, Centura Ware was not as successful as Pyrex or Corning Ware. It was profitable, but not spectacularly so, even with a television marketing campaign. Next slide, please. Here you can see some stills from television advertisements. Um, so on the left, you have the host of the Today Show trying to break the dishes and failing. And then on the right, you have uh, still images from the Bull in a China Shop commercial that literally showed a bull in a China shop and uh, you know, depicted the dishes that the bull knocked on the floor not breaking. But this didn't really convince consumers that this is what they wanted. So a lackluster performance of Centura Ware set the stage for the development of Corel. In 1965, Corning scientist James Giffen worked to create ultra thin, ultra strong dishware to accompany Corning Ware and achieve its commercial success. This was no happy accident. This was a deliberate attempt to build a better dish. Next slide. Giffen proposed using a laminate structure of two different kinds of glass to create a thin and relatively unbreakable dish. Uh, he used two uh, external layers of transparent glass to contain a middle layer of opaque opal glass and found that that gave him the winning combination of properties that he desired. The name Corel came very late in the process, well after the product was invented and the production challenges were worked out. Corel, in fact, won out over a consultant for consulting firm's unfortunate and somewhat trite suggestion of forever. Next slide, please. Consumer testing began in April of 1970, and by July, Corel Livingware was in full-scale production. And what you are seeing here is the sell sheet that introduced the product to retailers. So although the production formula was definitely key to Corning's success, there were other factors that helped Corel along. One was a two-year warranty on the dishes, and this was the first Corning consumer product that had this kind of guarantee, and uh, consumers were really excited about that, um, and it's thought that that really helped boost sales. Uh, next slide, please. So some other factors that led to Corel's success is that you could purchase it as a set rather than purchasing it as individual pieces. So here you see an ad showing it off as a set. Um, you will also notice there's a picture of a dishwasher down there. So those of you who have China that's uh, perhaps been passed down your family know that you don't dare put that in a dishwasher, uh, but Corel does go in the dishwasher. Um, and another marketing feature that uh, was touted and people seem to like is that when you tap on Corel, it, it rings like China rings. So it had these important properties that reminded people of the fine dining ware uh, that was in their homes. 
um, the presence of bowls in the set actually was also very popular with consumers. So I don't know, I, maybe that's something to do with the rise of you know, sugared cereals, I'm not sure. Cereal for dinner is never a bad option, right? Uh, and then there were the designs. Next slide, please. So it was introduced with relatively few designs, but it didn't take long for there to just be uh, an explosion of interesting designs and patterns put on the dishes. And here you see um, the, the, this particular pattern. Uh, if you read the ad, it was intended for singles and couples with a busy lifestyle who want to entertain but don't want to worry about the hassle of fine china. Next slide, please. And this is what I mean by an explosion of patterns, right? Look at all of these. Uh, you can see the introduction of coordinating glassware uh, so your whole table could match. Um, and you have lots of different patterns there to match your personal style. Uh, next slide, please. And this is interesting. Um, in the 1990s, uh, you can sort of see that uh, some, uh, some of the designs are uh, classified as good, but then there's some that are better, right? And the better ones, as you can see, have more serving pieces. So maybe those are meant for entertaining. So you could have your everyday corral and then your good corral. Um, so the options were seemingly endless and again, very popular with consumers. Next slide, please. All right, and then in 1998, Corning Incorporated sold its housewares division to Borden, uh, and the new company was named World Kitchen, which later became Corel Brands and today is known as Instant Brands. Uh, and we, as you know, we have some folks from Instant Brands with us today, and we'll be turning things over to them. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Colleen. Um, that was so interesting. I especially enjoyed hearing that Corel was almost named Corever. And we are looking forward to seeing a little more what, of what's in the archives later on in this event. So we'll be checking back in with you later. Right. Our next speaker is David Earle, Vice President of Glass Engineering and Technology at Instant Brands. David has over 35 years experience in ceramic and glass R&D and manufacturing. Throughout his career, David has held multiple positions in both industry and academia. And since 2013, David has been with Corel Brands, or Instant Brands now. His role involves providing manufacturing problem-solving support, developing lower cost manufacturing processes, improving product quality, as well as testing and qualifying new glass raw materials, and the list goes on. In 2018, David took over a major glass tank rebuild and life extension development. I asked David earlier what Corel pattern he uses in his home, and he said that he has frost just like Colleen does. And in case anyone was wondering, the pattern that I use in my home is called Provincial. So we're so glad that David is here to join us today. Welcome, David. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, next slide. So uh, first of all, what does an engineering and technology team look like for a very small glass company? Uh, we, we only have six engineers, two are PhDs, and we have two technicians. Uh, we do lead cross-functional teams throughout the company though, so we have a, a lot of leverage. Uh, we're basically responsible for any new glass materials, new processes, new equipment, and all new product development. Uh, but in addition, we're responsible for designing and rebuilding our melting tanks, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. Um, we not only support the uh, Corning Corel factory, but we also uh, support the Charleroi factory that makes Pyrex. Uh, we have a Malaysia factory that decorates Corel, and uh, we support all our sourced ceramic and glass, and that includes Pyroceram Visions from France. Um, we do have a lot of innovation coming up in 2022. I can't divulge that information specifically yet. I think Rosemary is going to talk a little more specific on designs, but uh, we've got some exciting new functions for Corel, you know, in addition to the new designs and new shapes. Okay, next slide. Uh, so I just have a few minutes to talk, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about our unique melting process. Uh, we have basically in our factory here in Corning three large uh, core glass tanks. 
Uh, the core glass is the inner glass. It's about 95% of the total volume of each uh, wear shape. And for each core tank is attached to three glaze tanks. And the glaze is the small outer layers that, that comprise the three, three layer laminate product. Um, our core tanks are all very large. Uh, they're all 12 feet high. Uh, the larger tanks, the two larger tanks of the three have 21 foot diameter and they hold 300 tons of molten glass. Um, we, we have the only cold crown vertical melters in the world. And these uh, type of melters have a blanket of raw material, a couple of feet thick on top of the molten glass. And it's constantly fed onto the molten glass. Uh, as you can see in the picture on the left, uh, there, there are also videos online of how to make Corel, so you can take a look at the process there. Um, so at the interface between the, uh, the layer of raw material and the molten glass is where all, all the reaction and melting occurs. Uh, the tanks are 100% electrical melting. It, there's no burners in these tanks to melt. And uh, the glass contains fluorine. So fluorine is the ingredient that causes the whiteness in Corel. Uh, which is good, but the bad thing is fluorine is very corrosive to the tank walls. That's why we have to shut down tanks every four to five years and rebuild. Um, the picture on the lower right shows one of the tanks we've shut down recently. We're, we're getting ready to demolish the old tank and re rebuild a new one. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is just, a, again, I can't divulge a lot of technical information, but this is just a simple schematic of one core tank attached to three glaze tanks. And we have three of these, so a total of nine different production lines. But the arrows point to orifices where the core glass comes in contact with the glaze glass. They're laminated together to make that three layer product that we, after this process, we formed into the Corel shape. Okay, next slide. Uh, just a quick overview of the process. And again, you can see some of this online on how to make Corel. Uh, batching, as I mentioned before, we have two different compositions. 17 ingredients go into these uh, glass compositions, but typical for silicate glasses, uh, the biggest component is silica or from sand. Uh, melting, I talked about the three different tanks and the different compositions and the lamination that adds strength. Uh, for forming, we use what we call a hub so this is a circular machine that rotates and you can see it in the upper right hand corner. Uh, the molten glass sheet from the orifice that laminates the glasses together in the molten state that is pulled into the hub and then uh, vacuums in each mold in the hub, pull the, the shape into the mold and then it is cut with a, uh, a trimmer. And you can see in the bottom of that picture, uh, the product travels down to a fire polishing or you know flames uh, that smooth the edges. And then uh, after the shape forming, the product is fired in a layer, and the specific firing cycle that's used tempers the wear and increases the strength significantly. So you've got two strength increase mechanisms, the lamination and the firing. And then finally, uh, and Rosemary will talk a little bit more about what we're doing with decoration. Uh, we have 10 different decoration machines, five different processes used to decorate wear. Okay, next slide. And then, you know, finally, what makes Corel special? Uh, what differentiates it from other products? It's really the strength and the lightness. It's stronger than the competition, yet it's it's lighter and thinner. So um, we technically call the vitrell or the uh, Corel glass that we make here in Corning vitrell, and that is the laminated three-layer structure. Sometimes you'll see products like coffee mugs that we import uh, called Corel coordinates. That does not have the laminated glass, but it still uses the Corel product name. So uh, the core glass, the thick portion is about two and a half millimeters thick. And the glazed glass, that skin layer on top and bottom that laminates the product is only 0.062 millimeters. So, you know, the analogy, uh, human hair thickness, this is quite a bit thinner than a, the diameter of a human hair. And again, the, uh, the composition, the lamination and the firing give Corel its strength. Okay, so that's it. We'll take questions a little bit later. Thanks, David. Wow, and it's amazing to think that those core glass tanks that I've seen so many times can hold 300 tons of glass. That's 
it's just, I did had no idea that they could hold that much. And, um, you know, the videos that, um, that David was telling you about that are available online, um, actually on this slide, you can see we have some kind of videos playing on a loop of that manufacturing process. So you can kind of get an idea a little bit more of how that hub works um, if you come in and visit the exhibition. And as David mentioned, we are about halfway through our program. And so if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can at the end of our program. Our next speaker is Rosemary Mingle. Rosemary has been working as a designer for Instant Brands for over 10 years. Throughout this time, she has worked across many of the brands in the portfolio, including Instant Pot, Pyrex, and Corningware, but her main focus has been on Corel dinnerware. She has always been drawn to art and design and loves being able to incorporate both passions into new patterns. Rosemary currently lives in Corning, New York with her husband, Kyle, and her Greyhound, Cross. When she's not designing, Rosemary enjoys ballet, reading, and spending time outdoors in scenic upstate New York. Rosemary shared with us that she has many curl patterns at home, but her favorite one to use is an embossed pattern called Sweat. Rosemary, I can't wait to hear what goes on into creating new patterns and designs for curl, so I'm passing the mic over to you now. Thank you, Catherine. So today I'm just gonna give you a little sneak peek behind the scenes of what goes into the development of some of the new curl patterns. I've picked two of my personal favorite designs to share with you today. The first pattern is called Lumos. Um, essentially, whenever we start developing patterns, we actually take a step backwards and we look at trends. So we look at what is happening in home decor, what is happening in fashion, in lifestyle trends. We'll look at bloggers, we'll look at the internet, we subscribe to a lot of trend forecasting sites, and we try to see what's going on in the market and uh, make an educated guess of what we think is going to perform well in about a year's time, because that's how long it typically takes us to develop one new pattern. In this instance with the Lumos pattern, what we were seeing was what we called a natural formations trend space. So things were a lot of natural woods, they were inspired by nature, but in a very abstract way. So a lot of marble textures, painterly designs, uh, wood textures, stone textures, things of that nature. So the board you're seeing on screen right now is an example of something that I created to sort of make a visual representation of all of these trends that we were seeing at the time. I pull things from a lot of different sources, the internet, these trend forecasting sites that we subscribe to, and we use this as a jumping off place to create patterns. Some of the patterns I have the pleasure of creating myself, but we also do source designs. We work with a network of designers from all over the world, um, which really helps create a diversity of designs. And the goal is always to create enough designs that everyone can find something in the curl portfolio that resonates with them. The next step, uh, in terms of creating patterns, it um, depends on the pattern itself. I do a lot of work both in natural media, so I'll do paintings using both watercolors, acrylics, things of that nature. Sometimes I'll sketch things out by hand, but I also do a lot of design work on the computer using programs like Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Illustrator. Really depends on what's inspiring me that day and uh, what works best for that specific type of pattern. If I'm doing something by hand, I will ultimately have to scan that into the computer um, to finalize the design. Once we have a nice assortment of designs for a trend space like this, we might create anywhere from 10 to even 50 designs that I create or that we source from our network of designers. We typically then take those designs into consumer research. So um, I unfortunately don't get to pick which designs we launch every year. Sometimes I wish I did, but it's nice to get a good touch point with the consumer to see which designs are really resonating with them, which ones would they want to purchase. Um, and that really gives us a guide as to which patterns we'll launch every year. So if you go on to the next slide, this is the Lumos pattern um, as it is printed and you can find in the market today. So you can see in this instance of what actually launched was a really beautiful sort of pattern inspired by natural textures, bubbles, um, it was hand painted by myself. Um, I love that it uses predominantly gray as a neutral pattern with small hits of color. So you can really dress it up or dress it down and mix and match it with a lot of colors that might be in your kitchen. Um, 
We also work very closely with the manufacturing teams, as David alluded to, to make sure that these patterns are manufacturable. Because Corel is such a unique material, we really have a lot of restrictions on what we can and can't do, but we try to hide those from the general public. Um, so we never want you to know what we can and can't do. We always want you to just be excited by our patterns. Um, but we do want the pattern to be manufacturable as well so that we can hopefully run and sell millions and millions of pieces. Okay, on to the next slide. The next uh, pattern I wanted to spotlight is our newest Star Wars collaboration. And uh, this is interesting because it's a totally different process from a sort of everyday Corel pattern that we might develop. This one we get to collaborate very closely with the Lucasfilm team on. So it does start in a similar fashion. In this case, sourcing trend images. I sourced some and the Lucasfilm team did as well. Um, in this case, we were looking at a lot of sort of artistic inspired, very soft geometric patterns with uh, hand-drawn touch. We were also looking at sort of a muted color palette that was sort of soft uh, neutrals. Um, and it was really, really fun to collaborate with the Lucasfilm team on this project. They're a really great partner for us to work with, and it was very exciting to hear their insights in terms of what tends to resonate with the Star Wars consumer and learning more about that consumer as well. Uh, something that I found really interesting was really the diversity of Star Wars consumers. Um, there's so many people that are now fans of both the shows that they have, such as The Mandalorian, as well as the classic Star Wars films and the new Star Wars films. So we really endeavored to create a wide uh, type of pattern that would resonate with this wide, diverse audience that is uh, fans of Star Wars. So if you go on to the next slide. This is the design that we just launched on May the 4th. Um, if any of you are Star Wars fans out there, you know May the 4th is a very important Star Wars holiday. So we wanted to time our launch accordingly with that. So what I did when I created this was I used some of the assets that were provided by Lucasfilm. So if you look at Chewie, uh, Princess Leia, and Darth Vader, those were some beautiful line drawings that I found in the Lucasfilm archive of art assets. Um, but I knew I wanted to do a four pack of plates. So I actually added a Stormtrooper concept and an R2-D2 concept to that collection. I also added some fun star doodles and things like that to the black and white line drawings that were already there. When I was looking at them, I then noticed, hmm, these need some color. So I added a nice watercolor wash to the plates, but I didn't want them all to match. So I did a fun blue story where each character has their own shade of blue, green, or teal. Um, we loved pairing this in the photo with the blue milk, felt like that was a fun nod to the Star Wars fan, um, but also blue is a really universally appealing color, again, to appeal to that diverse audience of the Star Wars fan. So once I had these concepts, and I had a couple of them, not just the final ones you see here today, I took those back to the Lucasfilm team and we discussed the pro and cons, which one we liked best. And they really loved this concept. And they recommended that we proceed forward with R2-D2, not the Stormtrooper, because R2 is such a popular character. So he made the cut and the Stormtrooper got shelved. Once again, it was really fun to see these designs come to life and work on this really fun partnership. Some licensing partners that we work with for these collabs are more open to this kind of interpretation. Some uh, just want you to take what their art is and put it on the plate, which is okay too, but I really enjoyed working on this Star Wars partnership. If you have any questions, um, I'm happy to answer them at the end, um, but thank you for listening. Thank you, Rosemary. Uh the Lumos pattern is so pretty. And how fun are those Star Wars dishes? I'm so glad that R2-D2 is the one that made the cut. Um, and I may have to go out and get myself some of those after this. Um, but before we get to our Q&A session, Colleen has a few more gems that she'd like to share with us from the Corel archive. So I'm gonna pass it over to Colleen. Thank you. And Rosemary, what a wonderful introduction you gave me to this part of the program, uh, because you talked about finding inspiration in the archives uh, for the Star Wars design. So now we're going to talk a little bit about archives. Um, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to, to tell you about a new archival collection um, that the Ray Cow Research Library acquired in 2017. Um, but before I get too far down that path, uh, I do want to talk a little bit more about what archives are. I get this question all the time, like, what's, what's an archivist? Um, and although archives are 
often found in libraries. And that's the case here at the Corning Museum of Glass. An archives is not a library by another name. Uh, archives hold unpublished or informally published records of enduring historic value. And those include things like letters, diaries, photographs, reports, meeting minutes, design sketches, um, like Rosemary used, sound recordings, video recordings, lots of different formats. Um, so the core unit of a library is a published book, but the core unit of an archives is an archival collection. And what you're seeing on the screen right now is a picture of what archival stacks look like there on the left. Like, what does a collection look like? It can be very small. It can be a single piece of paper. Uh, it can be very large, and that's more often the case, you know, over a thousand boxes of material or any volume in between. Um, and at the RACAO, we have about 230 archival collections that my terrific team and I uh, help steward. Um, so um, archivists uh, preserve, organize, and provide access to this co these uh, collections. And if you go to the next slide, um, that will show you what we spend a lot of time on, this is the first page of the online representation of what we call a finding aid or a guide to a collection to help researchers find their way through the collection and locate the desired information. Um, so yes, when you have a thousand boxes of material, my goodness, how, how, where's the map? How do you figure out how to use it? And that's what we spend a lot of time doing is, is preparing the documentation and readying the records for research uh, use. Um, the next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we received a collection in 2017 uh, that we have called the World Kitchen Media and Design Archives. And it was donated to us by the, co the company that's now known as Instant Brands. And uh, we received 180 boxes of materials when it arrived. And here in this photo, you're seeing about half of a collection um, as it was loaded onto six pallets to be taken uh, over to a warehouse uh, where our fantastic processing archivist, Sarah Ellender, could begin to work on them and make them accessible to researchers. So we are hoping that we are going to have these ready to go uh, for all of you uh, in early 2022. Um, so while the collection isn't quite ready for research yet, all of the historic materials you've seen today and in my presentation slides have come from the collection. Next slide, please. So, as you already know, uh, the World Kitchen Media and Design Archives contain a lot of records documenting the full line of Corning Housewares brands. And a lot of that uh, consists of print ads or uh, trade catalogs, just product documentation of that nature. And you see another example of that here. Next slide. The collection also includes a lot of design drawings. Um, the earliest that I've seen go back into the 1930s and then all the way up to the relatively recent. Um, so to be honest, we have not started processing that part of the collection yet, but we are really looking forward to uh, diving in and seeing what is in there. Next slide. We have a lot of product photographs. So this is fantastic documentation of not just everything that was made, but also how it was packaged, how it was branded and, and so forth. So this is also a very rich resource. Uh, next slide. For collectors, you will find handy dandy things like this reference guide to the patterns of Corel when they were uh, introduced, uh, when they were discontinued. Um, you know, I like how you can see a warranty column there too. Two years, two years, two years. Um, that famous two year warranty is appearing. Uh, so resources like this are really great because you're getting so, you know, you're getting right into the source of the information at the time of production. So it's very high quality information for those of you who are really interested in this. Uh, next slide. All right, uh, this is one of my favorite images in the collection, actually. This, uh, we have some manufacturing and production material in this collection as well. Um, so here, what you're seeing is a schematic that just shows in an incredibly charming way the process of making Corel, uh, the pressware plant. Um, so we have some uh, video materials as well uh, of this nature. 
uh, but um, the schematics are some of my favorite things. Okay, next. Last but not least, uh, we acquired in this collection a lot of television commercials. And uh, what you're seeing here, um, gosh, look at that on the right there, the old VHS uh, format near and dear to our hearts. Um, much of it is on antiquated media forms, uh, which makes it a bit of a challenge to, to get to, but we have ways of doing that. Uh, and then on the other side, what you're seeing there is kind of the storyboard for the commercial. Now it's clearly after the fact, right? Because what you're seeing there are the uh, actors and actresses in the commercial. Presumably this was kind of a reference guide so that when you're choosing, you know, which commercial do we send off to be played at NBC? Oh, right, this one, this is a good one. Let's make sure it's that one. And um, I'm gonna wrap up my presentation with a peek at some of these commercials. Our wonderful digital media department here at the museum uh, digitized some um, mostly Corel uh, commercials, but also some Corningware commercials for you to take a look at. So we're going to play those now. From the freezer to the oven to the table. From the freezer to the oven to the table. From the freezer to the oven to the table. From the freezer to the oven to the table. The more work your pots and pans can do, the less work you have to do. That's why Corningware goes. From the freezer to the oven. It's not plastic, china, or earthenware. It's a new material from Corning. We call it Corel Livingware. Looks like china, yet safe in the oven and dishwasher. Corning promises to replace any piece that will break, chip, graze, or stain during two years of everyday use. Available in beautiful patterns. 20-piece service for four, only $29.95. New Corel Livingware by Corning. Until Corning invented Corel Livingware, no dishes that were so much like China could take everyday pounding. Of course, Corel isn't totally indestructible, but it is so tough, Corning promises to replace free any piece that breaks, chips, cracks, or stains in two years of everyday use. So even if you manage to break our dish, we'll never break our promise. Corel Livingware, 20-piece set starts at $19.95. When you're just married and learning to cook, you need cookware. <gasps> Ooh. Easy to clean, <laughs> and you need all the help you can get. You know, with kids in no time at all, you need cookware that lets you freeze meals in advance. So, you can just take them out and heat them up. Honestly, you need all the help you can get. When you entertain a great deal, you need cookware that's versatile and looks attractive. Frankly, you need all the help you can get. One dish does the work of three. Because at Corning, we know a woman needs all the help she can get. The woman of tomorrow will program her meals. Her kitchen computer handles the details, moves frozen dishes into the oven without defrosting, this will call for special cookware made of space-age ceramic. She has a whole set to use for cooking, mixing, and preparing all kinds of dishes. Incredibly hard and smooth, it quickly washes sparkling white, inspires creative touches in the meal she prepares. And because this remarkable cookware is actually Corningware, freeze, cook, serve ware, it goes proudly to the table. Beautiful Corningware work savers, the cookware of tomorrow. And yet, any of these pieces can be yours today. Get started on a Corningware set now. Get a head start on the future.
レールと仲良くしてください。壊れない幸せ、コレール。いわきガラスです。You might think I'm crazy to go camping with good Corel dishes. But Corel's so tough, it can handle just about anything that comes along. Wherever you eat, Corel provides the perfect setting. Corel Living Wear by Corning in 10 patterns. With the new classic black corning wear and the black dinnerware patterns from Corel. Designed for serving, cooking, or just looking. Designed for living, corning. When Linda Kay bought her new Corel, she sent the old set to her daughter in Australia. a journey halfway around the world, imagine how many trips it can make to your table. The old gang's coming for dinner, including her. Hey, I'm still thin, and my table looks great. My Corel stands up to any occasion in patterns that will make her green with envy. Then she'll match the Corel. Today's Corel, the look you love to live with. Guess who's dropping by? Ted's parents. No problem, I just whipped up some pasta and took out the corral. My tiger lily is perfect for soothing the savage in-laws. I'll have them purring in no time. Today's corral, the look you love to live with. My daughter's boyfriend is coming to dinner first time. Well, I'll make her look good. My corral comes in beautiful patterns like symphony that stand up to any occasion. <laughs> now he better look as good as my table. Today's corral, the look you love to live with. Oh my goodness, those ads. I am chuckling over here. That's hilarious. Um, so we have made it to the question and answer portion of our program. Thank you so much, Colleen, for sharing those uh, fantastic ads with us. Um, so I'm going to be reading out the questions and directing them to our speakers. And I think the first question might be for Rosemary. Rosemary, um, one of our audience members asks, are designs universal across the globe or do the dishware designs change from region to region based on cultural preferences? How does this impact market research before launching a new design? Yeah, great question. So uh, we do sort of two buckets of patterns typically, ones that are Asia specific and ones that are more tailored towards North America and Europe. Um, those are our biggest markets. So most of the designs that I work on are specifically for the North America market, um, but sometimes they do get picked up in Asia as well and vice versa. Um, we try not to duplicate efforts if we don't have to, but we do tend to do specific pattern development and research cycles for both regions. Perfect, thank you so much. Our next question I think is for you, David. Ted is wondering at what temperature is the glass melted and at what temperature is it formed? Yeah, the melting, um, it depends on the production rate and that's a function of the size of the wear we're producing. But in general, it's around 1420 to 1450 degrees C melting temperature. And at forming, it's roughly 1100 degrees C, 1000 to 1100, so very hot. Thank you very much. Yeah, definitely very hot. Um, and this question, this next question might be for you, David, or maybe for Rosemary. Um, Liz wonders, can you describe how the patterns are impressed onto the glass? Rosemary, you want me to take Sure, I, I can take that one. Okay. Uh, so we have a lot of different printing technologies that we use, uh, both at the Corning facility and in our Malaysia decoration facility. Uh, so they range from everything from screen printing, which is essentially how you would make a t-shirt where you have a screen that gets exposed with the pattern and you have a squeegee that comes across and prints it. 
there is other processes that are more like pad printing. So essentially, again, it's through a screen, the design is picked up on this giant head and it's picked up and then it's placed on the plate and it's done one color at a time. And then in Malaysia, they also do hand applied decals. So they, all of the colors get printed at once on a piece of paper. And then that gets essentially placed by hand by people who work in the Malaysia factory onto the dishes. Um, and then it gets, after any of these printing processes, it goes through our kiln cycle. So that's really what bakes it into the glass and makes the decorations durable and long lasting. Yeah, if I could add to that too. Uh, sure. the, the material in the frit is uh, primarily a, a glass powder, a frit, and Corning patented that formulation many years ago. And you can't find it anywhere else. We're still uh, having other companies make it for us, but that glass powder has a thermal expansion that matches Corel's unique glass. And uh, during the Lear firing, that powder melts and combines with the, uh, the pigments, the colorants, to adhere to the glass or the Corel glass and give it a nice, strong, you know, dishwasher uh, resistant and temperature resistant uh, decoration. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, as I understand it, the sort of the inks that are used um, to decorate the curl patterns are like fused to the glass itself. So you can't scrape it off or anything. So yes. it makes it very durable. Correct. Perfect. Um, and another question, maybe this is for you, David. What is the daily production of Corel? Yeah, that's a good question. I Let me tell you, uh, per tank, uh, there's about 35 million pieces per year. Um, per, per, per tank, every day we put about uh, 220,000 uh, tons of material through the, the tank every, every day. So I'm sorry, 220,000 wow. pounds per day, yeah. Wow, that's a lot. Um, awesome, thank you. Um, we have a question for Colleen. Colleen, this is from Ted, who wonders, are the archives digitized or are they being digitized? That's a great question. Um, selectively, yes, we are digitizing them. So uh, one thing we're concerned about in preserving this collection into the future is the presence of magnetic media. So those would be the videotapes uh, that these commercials that you just saw were produced on. And that media does not, uh, it does not perform well over time, shall we say. So that's really where our priority is for digitization is uh, making sure that we capture the audiovisual materials that are most in danger. Beyond that, I could imagine us perhaps doing some selective digitization of materials that we think would be really popular with our researchers and collector community. Thanks, Colleen. Um, okay, I think this next question is for David. Jeff is wondering, do the glaze and core glasses have the same coefficient of expansion? Is the fast cooling process similar to that making tempered glass? Yeah, but great questions. Um, no, they have a different thermal expansion. So the core has a higher thermal expansion than the glaze. So when after firing, the uh, core shrinks more than the glaze and glaze basically puts the glaze in compression. Um, the firing adds to that process because we basically fire to a certain point in the glass where the molecules can move around and then we rapidly cool. So we, the, the product, so we freeze the surface uh, during this tempering cycle, it is a tempering cycle, the interior continues to shrink and it adds more compression and strength to the product. So. Thanks, David. That's awesome. And one more uh, question. Technically, how is the Corel of today different than the Corel from 25 or 50 years ago? Yeah, good, another good question. Um, I've been with the company seven and a half years, and based on what I've seen and what I've been told, the composition uh, the product specifications and the performance criteria have not changed, have not changed since uh, it was developed by Corning. Even though sometimes we wonder why are we going through all this trouble to make our product, you know, drop and, and not break at 90 inch drop as opposed to the competition is, is breaking at 20 inches. You know, do, do we really need to do that? But we have not changed the specs. However, we have changed a lot of the, in, in, the raw materials to get to our composition and performance and equipment. For example, the, the melting tanks 
you know, traditionally 44 months was the life of a tank because they were out through the temperature and fluorine, but we've introduced new technology that uh, took it from 44 to 60 month life. So that, that's a big deal. It's a very expensive to rebuild the tanks to extending that life uh, significantly really helps, helps the business. But the products mm -hmm. should be the same. Wonderful. And you just mentioned fluorine. Um, we had another question that uh, someone noted that you said that fluorine is the source of the white in the glass. And they're curious, and I'm not sure if you're able to answer this question, but they'd like to know, how is the fluoride introduced to the material? Is it sodium fluoride? Can you tell us what the composition is of that material? Yeah, I mean, I can just tell you in general, the primary ingredient is, is fluoride. It's calcium fluoride, and it melts completely during the melt. And then during cooling, it, the same material recrystallizes to a smaller particle size, and it's the right particle size to provide whiteness, you know, the opacity. So it, it's, it's a, a fluoride, a mineral. Okay, so calcium fluoride, um, and that sounds like something you just mine out of the earth, right? Right, it's, it's right, typical, uh, one of the minerals, yes. Perfect, thank you. Um, I found that question very interesting because my background is chemistry, so of course, huh? I, I also was excited to have that question answered. Um, here is another question, and this might be for David as well. Anne asks, is Instant Brands continuing to offer factory tours for um, students of the studio at the Corning Museum of Glass? That's a great question. Um, I think with COVID, things kind of went uh, silent for over a year. So we haven't done it in a long time. If someone, I'd be happy for someone to contact me and I could check it out and probably arrange it. I believe so, but we're still wearing masks in the factory. So I think, you know, we have to wait until that uh, subsides and it'll take some time, but I'm, I'm hoping later this year, uh, things will, will clear up. But Again, I'm not in HR, so we haven't had a tour in a long time, but I'd be happy to check. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, the tour is great. I've been on it. Um, and yeah, COVID really threw a wrench in the works for, for a lot of us, but hopefully things will get back to normal soon. Um, one question from Ellen, and I think this is more for Rosemary. Rosemary, Ellen wants to know, what was or what is the most popular design pattern? Yeah, it has definitely changed over the years. I will say white is always popular. So just plain white undecorated dishes that always sells the best. Um, one of the longstanding most popular patterns is the country cottage pattern. Um, and then a more recent one is the splendor pattern, which we actually did on a bunch of different shapes. It's on a square shape. It was on a wide rim shape. It's on our basic coop round shape. Uh, so those are definitely some of the top ones for recent memory. Perfect. Well, I'm sure Star Wars is going to be right up there. As soon as, I hope so. <laughs> as soon as it catches on. Yeah, yeah. Um, Marianne asks, I have Pyrex and Corning Ware from the 1970s that I still use to cook and bake in. Is there any harm in this? That was, okay, I, I can answer that. That was... Uh, Thanks. Before, sure, before my time, but people have baked in Pyrex for decades. Uh, it's still being baked with. It's a great product for baking, so uh, there's no problem with that. And corningware, there are different types of corningware. Um, as far as I know, because right now it's sourced, um, it's still all safe for baking. I would check the use and care and follow that, you know, to the T, but uh, those are great products for baking. Thank you, David, yeah. Um, we have a question for Colleen. Colleen, how do you prevent these old design drawings from the 1930s or from the 30s from deteriorating? Oh, another great question. Well, the interesting thing is that um, regular paper, actually, we, we know how it behaves uh, because we've had it around for a long time. And um, so, a lot of the way that we, we preserve uh, things like that has to do with the climate that we keep them in. And so um, archives, unlike a, a, you know your local public library, archival material are housed in uh, special um, 
secured stacks usually, um, so they're not open to the public and are kept at a cooler temperature and a stable relative humidity to preserve the length uh, of life of the paper. And paper under the right conditions will last hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, but your question gets in a really um, interesting challenge with design drawings, and that is that design drawings are sometimes um, not on high quality paper, right? Because you don't know which design is going to go on to be the big hit and which one you're going to say, well, we put that out there and nobody liked it, nobody bought it, it's eh, not that important. So uh, design drawings have special challenges. And, um, you know, we, we do what we can uh, in terms of um, keeping them in acid-free housing, uh, so special folders and boxes that are acid-free. We may decide to uh, selectively digitize some so that when folks want to access them, they can start with the digital design, uh, and then if they need to see the paper, then we will pull that out of storage and let them access that. But most access is usually um, uh, can usually be handled through a digital copy. So those are the, some, some of the ways that we uh, strive to preserve that material. Thank you, Colleen. So interesting. So this next question, I'm going to shoot over to Rosemary. Rosemary, is the base glass or the core glass for Corel dishes, is it always white? Good question. Uh, no, it is not always white. We have done various shades of tint and sort of ivory glass in the past. Um, the problem is uh, sort of a technology problem. Right now, the only way to tint the glass is to tint that entire huge glass tank that David showed you. So it's very expensive um, and it has to be a color that we know we're gonna make a lot of that color and it's going to be very successful. Um, that's why we mostly stick to white because you can really do a lot with white in terms of adding different colors and it goes with lots of people's kitchens, um, whereas other colors might be for a smaller market. Thank you. Yeah, and I have seen some of those older dishes that were sort of tinted. Um, and it's, it's, it's almost a little like that's Corel because I'm not, I'm so not used to seeing that. Um, but it makes sense that, yeah, you'd want to make sure that it was going to sell before you do that to the entire 300 tons tank yes. <laughs> of glass. Yeah. Uh, a question from Edward, and this might be for you, David. What is the predicted lifespan for a piece of Corel? He says, I'm still using a Corel set from the 1970s and it still looks new. That's a great question. Of course, the answer is that depending on how it's used, you know, if it's used properly, use and care, but I mean, it's, it's glass. So under normal use and care, proper use and care, it should never wear out. Uh, if it's abused, of course it, it would, but it's, it's a solid, uh, strong piece of glass. So, um, and good luck, and I'm sure you're going to have it for many more years to come. Yeah, I hope so. That sounds great. Well, that will be it for our last question. We're running short on time. So thank you so much um, for your lovely answers for all those questions. And I think I have a slide. Yeah, if you have any research questions about Corel, you can submit them to the, the RACAL Research Library staff at libanswers.cmog.org. Next slide, please. And I wanted to thank all of our speakers for their time today and remind everyone um, that you can come visit the Corning Museum of Glass and see uh, Dish It Corel at 50. It's on view now. Um, and I just also wanted to thank Instant Brands um, for generously sponsoring this exhibition. And thank all of you for attending this program. Um, we really hope to see you at the next Connectify Glass. And that's it for today. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you.